Thank you, Charlotte. Good afternoon, everybody. It's good to have you here with us, uh, uh, gathering however we can on this Wednesday night. God's given us a beautiful spring day. I don't know about you, but I, I hope you're enjoying uh, these beautiful days that God has given us. We know there's been some storms and uh, different things, but there sure have been some beautiful days. And the Bible says this is the day that the Lord has made. We'll rejoice and be glad in it. And my heart is glad tonight uh, to be able to come together again with some good news on the horizon. Uh, things seem to be uh, doing very well as far as the virus is concerned. Uh, where I live in Cleveland, I think there's two to three uh, active cases, so that's it. Things are getting much better there, and we pray it continues. And here in Polk County, I don't know if there's any at this point. I know there's only been a couple that had it, but I think maybe, uh, hopefully, we're out of the woods. So when our governor came out uh, and said that at the end of this month, he was going to be uh, lifting the stay-at-home order, I've uh, been praying about it. Jimmy and I have been talking and praying, and we feel like that first Sunday in May, we're going to come back into the church. Uh, many other churches are doing similar things. Of course, we are going to be responsible about it. We're going to buy it as much as we can uh, by some of those guidelines set down just for safety's sake. But for those of you who have been waiting, we've been doing this for a month now. By the time we're done, it'll be over a month. That first Sunday in May, we'll be back together. So I hope you'll be here with us. Uh, we'll still be doing this, of course, for those of you who can't attend. Those of you who want to be here, who have a desire, and, and you want to come, come on. Um, if you're not feeling well, please you know, stay home. We'll keep doing it this way for those of you who don't feel good. And there are some people who are still worried and concerned, and, and it's not my, not my calling in life to make you change your mind. My job is to preach the gospel. So if you want to come, if you want to be here, we'll be here on that first Sunday in May. Now, this coming Sunday, which is the last Sunday in April, I believe right now we're getting a good report for the weather. So we will plan on having drive-in services, both of them, morning and night. And we, we have such a good time with those. I really enjoy it. So come out, make plans. This Sunday we'll do the drive-in style service in the parking lot. We're hoping and praying that the weather stays the same. But uh, don't want to blab and go on for too long. Ron's going to come lead a song. And Faye and Kim have got a song to share. And then I want to bring you something from the uh, word that God's placed on my heart. So join me in a word of prayer. And then we'll get into singing. Father, we thank you tonight that you've drawn us together once again. And Father, we know we're uh, going through a lot right now. We know so many have a lot going on, a lot of worries, a lot of things are in their family. But God, we're thankful in the middle of it all, we can step back for just a moment and just be thankful. We can step back for just a moment and rejoice and give you glory. Father, you've been so good to us. And in spite of whatever happens in this old world, we're blessed. So God, tonight we pray that you'll be with our folks in our church who are sick, hurting, struggling, going through difficult times. We pray you'll help them, draw near to them. We do pray for those who are listening also, uh, those maybe who are going through things silently. Maybe they don't, others don't know what they're going through. I pray that you'll help them. But Father, tonight I pray that this service uh, would be uplifting and glorifying to Christ, that it might bring Him glory, not us, and that everything we do might draw us nearer to you. We sure do thank you for this opportunity, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, Brother Ron, lead a song or two for us.
good real good aren't you glad that Jesus is always right on time we got a request uh, through the uh, broadcast there to pray for a young lady uh, those of you in the Polk County community may know her Miss Temple Gentry uh, she's going to be having surgery in the morning uh, for some medical things not to go into too many details but just keep her lifted up and pray that God will help her and be with her and touch her uh, surgeries are always uh, uh, just an uncertain thing sometimes, especially when you're waiting to hear news. So just pray for her and uh, keep her lifted up. Uh, those of you that's got your Bibles tonight, let's go into the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter number 6. Tonight I want to deal with prayer. And the more I thought on this, it seems that God just kept giving and giving and giving. 
And then I realized there's no way I'm going to be able to preach tonight what God has given me. So what we'll do is this. We'll just on Wednesday nights for a while as the Lord leads, we'll just deal with prayer. Different thoughts on prayer, different topics of prayer, different teachings in the Bible on prayer. I love prayer. I think prayer is the most valuable thing that we have. I, I say that a lot, but I believe it. And it's probably also one of the most underused things that we have too. But tonight I want to look at a question that more people than I guess we probably would care to struggle with. And I want to look at how to pray. How to pray. Now in saying that I'm not talking about how to pray in far as the words to say. But how to pray in general. I'm convinced there are more people out there than we know that honestly Jimmy have no idea how to pray at all. It's not that they don't know what to say. They just don't know how to start, where to begin, how it works, what it is. They don't know anything about it. And the thought of praying is almost traumatizing to them. So I want to look in Matthew tonight, Matthew chapter 6, on this thought of how to pray. And you might be in that situation tonight. You might be one of those who really struggles with praying. Now, maybe not just praying publicly in a church or in a setting like that, but just praying yourself, maybe in your private life, in your personal life. Maybe you struggle with just how this works, how is it, you know, what is it, what do we do? And I think it's more common than what we think. But tonight, I want us to see that prayer is not a problem to be solved. It's a, it's a privilege to be shared. Prayer is not a problem. Prayer is a wonderful thing. Prayer should not stress you out. Prayer should make you want to uh, rejoice. The disciples here in the sixth chapter of Matthew came to Jesus and they asked him that very question. How do we pray? Lord, teach us to pray. They came to him and said, Lord, you pray a lot and we enjoy your prayers. We like it when you pray. Teach us to pray like you do. So let's read the scriptures tonight. Matthew chapter 6. I want to read verses 5 through verse 13 uh, for our text and then we'll build our thoughts from there. Matthew chapter 6 verse 5. This is Jesus speaking. The Bible says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the uh, corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut the door, pray to the Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. And be not therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God, we ask that you'll bless the reading of your word. Lord, we thank you for the songs that we've sung. We thank you for songs about Jesus. We thank you for the song about here you come right on time. And Lord, we know that you always have perfect timing. And God, we believe the message tonight is for all of us in a perfect time. We need to pray. We need to pray more. We need to know how to pray. And Father, I pray you'll reach those out there who struggle with this. Touch my own heart also that we may draw nearer, learn more, and have better prayer lives with you. I pray you'll touch the heart that's lost, that they might come to be saved. Be with those carrying burdens. I pray they'll find comfort in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. How to pray. My grandfather told me one time, he was in a, a church, I believe he was teaching Sunday school in this class, I cannot be sure. He told me that there was a man there, an older man who had been a fixture in the church, had been a part of the church, had worked in the church, and by all accounts was a tremendous person, tremendous Christian man. And in the Sunday school class, I believe the story was told to me, he was asked to pray. And he hesitated and he was quiet for a moment and he came back with this response, I don't know how. And it pretty well shocked everybody because this is a man that everybody thought pretty well knew how to pray. But he didn't. He didn't know how to pray. It wasn't that he didn't know how to talk. <laughs> it wasn't that. He didn't even know where to begin when it come to a prayer life. And, of course, they spent that, you know, rest of that time talking to him and trying to encourage him. But what had happened in that man's heart, I believe, now I didn't, I know, I didn't know him. 
All I can do is speculate. But I think what may have happened in that man's heart may be happening in some of our hearts today. When we overthink prayer, when we make it too complicated, when we make it too um, above and more what the Scriptures teaches us that it is. Now, it is a very special thing. I'm not taking away from uh, what prayer is. But prayer was not meant to be hard. Prayer is not meant to be something that we struggle with. Prayer should be something that is honestly the easiest thing you can do. Singing in front of people is hard. <laughs> Preaching in front of people is hard, especially after you've heard yourself talk. Uh, you know, things like that are hard. Praying should be something that comes with ease to you and to me. And uh, Now, what is uh, prayer? Well, prayer is talking to God, right? But then we've got this thought, well, God's omniscient, right? The Bible, He knows everything. The Bible says he knows it all. And even Jesus said, your father knows what you have need of before you ask him. So we're supposed to pray to God for things that we need when he already knows what they are. <laughs> so why pray, right? That brings the question, why should we pray at all? When you go back into the Bible and begin to look at what prayer really is, prayer, simply as I can put it, is communication. It's communication with God. Uh, just as though your communication with your husband or your wife is vital. If you don't talk to your husband or your wife, you're not going to have much of a relationship. You might have a few less fights and arguments, but you're not going to have a good marriage. Uh, the best marriages are built on communication. Those who talk to each other, who communicate. Now, the communication is probably not always the best communication, but yet still communication, talking to each other. And that's what prayer is. That's what prayer is, is talking to God and communicating with Him. You go back into the Old Testament and one of the first big prayers, I guess you might say, that we find is when Abraham is talking to God about what's going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. And he's talking to God. It's not a prayer like what we've seen on TV or it's not a prayer like we learned when we were children that we would, you know, recite and, and the, the standard prayers like that. This was Abraham talking to God about the situation in Sodom and saying, well, God, why would you destroy them? Well, how about this? And they're having a conversation. And at its simplest form, that's what prayer is, talking to God. Somebody said one time, talking to God like he's your friend. And that's about as perfect as you can explain it, talking to God like he is right here with you, like he is present with you and opening up to him like you would your closest uh, friend or loved one. But some people really struggle with that. Some people just really don't know about it. They don't know how to do it. And I want to look at this tonight because the, uh, the disciples asked Jesus this very thing. Lord, teach us how to pray. I want to show you some things prayer is not, first of all. Look here at the first few verses that I read. Go back to verse 5. Jesus tells us what prayer is not, okay? Verse 5, he tells us this. Prayer is not a public display. The Bible says, Jesus said... When thou prayest, uh, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Prayer is not meant to be a public display. What the hypocrites here Jesus is talking about would do is they would stand out on the street corner and they would pray to the top of their lungs for as long as they could and really try to make a, a show out of it, to bring attention to themselves, to make it really look like they love God, to really make it look like that they are just a, the closest thing to God there is. You know, listen to me pray. D.O. Moody had a habit of getting thrown out of churches, the great evangelist. There's a story told one time, I believe, in England or somewhere near he was in a large meeting, and the meeting was going to dismiss, and they were going to have a meal after the meeting. And somebody called on this man to pray, and he stood up, and he started to pray, and said the man just prayed on and on and on and on and on. Moody interrupted his prayer and said, while this brother catches up on his prayer life, let's go eat. <laughs> what he saw there is the problem that Jesus saw. That man was not praying from his heart. He was praying so that others may hear him. He was praying so that others may take a look and say, wow, this guy's something. Well, the problem with that is when we do that, we've got our reward. Uh, it's not going to be counted to you in heaven. It's going to be counted to you here on earth. There's an epidemic today of people who want to get attention for doing things for others. With all that's been going on with the storms that's come through, uh, there's a lot of people who have felt the need to go out and help others, and that's great. But in helping others, they want a picture 
or they want it to be recorded. They want attention for it. They want to have prayer with someone whose house has been destroyed. They want to have prayer with someone who is sick and downtrodden and needs food, but they want to make sure they got it on camera so that others can see. Well, if you want to do that, you're getting your reward. You're getting your glory here. Don't expect it when you get to heaven. When you get up there and think God's going to pat you on the back because you're doing something good. Listen, you're getting it here. You want your accolades, you'll get them. But you're going to get them here. It's not a public display. Also, it's not a prideful dissertation. Uh, read on in verse 6. But when thou prayest, enter into the closet. And when thou hast shut the door, pray to the Father which is in secret. And thy Father which is in secret shall reward thee openly. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Praying with pride in your heart. Praying with pride thinking, oh yeah, God's going to be excited and pleased with me. No, he's not. That's not what prayer is. It's not a public display. It's not a prideful dissertation. It's not a planned delivery. Verse 8 says, Be not therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. Now that's a blessing. That's a blessing. Have you ever tried to pray and the words just wouldn't come out? You, you know how to pray. You've gotten this part of it down. You've gotten the point of how to pray down. But sometimes when you pray, you just don't know what to say. I found that in my life before when things are just, you know, in turmoil. And you know you need to pray, but you're just not sure even where to start with it, how to pray. I face those things in ministry, and Jimmy has too. When there's things where you're not sure what the right thing is to do. We're facing one right now. I've been wanting to be in church since the first time we let it out. <laughs> you know, if it had been up to me. But the thing of it is, it's not up to me. It's not a dictatorship. This is a body of believers called together, right? So I had to really pray and seek God and, and ask for advice and, you know, what's the right thing? And seek God on it now and find out what to do. And I really didn't know how to pray, what to ask for. But that's where I'm glad God already knows. That's where I'm glad that God knows my heart better than I know it, and he knows how to help me. Okay, Jesus tells us what prayer is not. Now, I want to give you this, and I hope this will help you tonight. I want to give you five principles, okay? I want to give you five principles of prayer. Now, these ain't Richard's, okay? Richard didn't come up with these. These are Jesus laying these out. I've just put them in some kind of order to make it easier for you, hopefully. That's my prayer anyway. These aren't me. These are what Jesus taught us. Now, this is what we call the Lord's Prayer. You probably learned this when you were little. It sounds real familiar to you. It's also recorded in the book of Luke. The one that most kids say has a little bit of a blending of both of them. But this is the prayer that Jesus told his disciples. Verse 9 says, After this manner, therefore, pray ye. How to pray. Jesus says this is how. This is an example. Now, it's important to know, this isn't exactly how we have to pray every time. I know people who think that. They think that when they pray, they've got to say these exact words. That's not a bad thing, but that's not what this is. That's not what you have to do. Jesus is saying when you pray, here are some principles I want you to keep in mind. Number one, the relationship principle. Look in verse 9, the very first thing he says, Our Father. Okay? Our Father. The relationship principle. You need to understand something. God is not your Father if you are not saved. God is not your father if you are not born again. God is not your father if you are not under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is praying to his father, our father, the believer's father. In order for us to pray, we've got to have a relationship with God. Otherwise, who are we talking to? <laughs> if we don't believe, have you ever seen an atheist pray? Oh, they do. I worked with a man one time who proclaimed he was atheist. I think he was more agnostic. Then he was atheist, but nevertheless, he didn't necessarily believe in God. And if God was real, God didn't interfere with the affairs of men. He just kind of did his own thing. Well, I would talk to him, and we would have these deep conversations. And then one day, something happened. I cannot recall what it was. But he said, uh, this has happened. Pray for me. I'm like, oh, well, okay. He said, I've been praying too. <laughs> I said, you have. And then that brought up the conversation about Christ. And, of course, he's still not going to believe in Christ. He's still not even sure about God, but he's praying. Well, friend, who are you praying to? You see, our prayers are based, number one, on the fact that we're saved and born again, that he's our father. It's the relationship factor. Your father on this earth, you had conversations with him. You would talk to him. You had an audience with him no matter what. 
if my children need me, they've got my attention. My children have come to me in the middle of the night. My children have called me while I'm at work. My children have called me while I'm doing something that I need to focus my attention on. But when my children call for their daddy, I'm going to be there for my children. I've left work before when they've gotten sick. I've canceled meetings and I've even uh, canceled things that I probably needed to do to be there for them when they wanted to spend time with their father. Jesus says that's who you're talking to. You're talking to your father. The relationship principle. The principle that says he's not just the God of the universe that created everything. And he is. He's our father. He's our heavenly father that loves us more than our earthly father could have ever dreamed. I love my children. I'd give my life. I think all of us men would. We know we love our children. I'd do anything for them. I'd lay down my life for them. I'd give, I'd give a body part. I'd give whatever it took to take care of them. I would do it. But God loves them more than I ever will. God loves them more than I can ever fathom. And he loves you that much too. When you're praying, you're talking to the one that loves you more than anything else you'll ever understand. The relationship principle. Our Father. Listen, if you're saved, you are a child of God. You're not talking to a stranger. You're talking to your heavenly Father, okay? Now, not only the relationship principle, I want you to see the reverence principle. Look in verse 9 again. Our Father, which art in heaven. Now notice this. Hallowed be thy name. When we pray, there ought to be some respect. When we pray, there ought to be some reverence given to God. Jesus says, Hallowed be thy name. We're not talking, we should not, we should rather talk to God as though he were our friend, but we should revere God as though he is the God of all creation in the universe with respect and honor and dignity. Now, I will say this, there have been times in my life when things have been so difficult that my prayers weren't real reverential. You can read in the Bible about Moses. Moses had some conversations with God that weren't real reverential. But nevertheless, they were prayers. Nevertheless, they were communications with God. And uh, they later repented of that. That's a different subject for a different day. But when we pray, we're talking to our Father and we're coming to Him with respect. We're coming to Him in reverence. We're coming to Him because we know who He is, okay? The relationship principle, the reverence principle. Now look at the reliance principle. Verse 10, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. When we pray, we are to pray to God and rely on Him. And this is what this is talking about. I want to show you three things that we need to rely on when we pray. Number one, we need to rely on His plan Look at verse 10. Thy will be done. You see that? A lot of people struggle with that. A lot of people I know struggle with that. A lot of people in the church struggle with that. It is not our job to tell God what to do. The, the, the idea of prayer is not for man's will to be done in heaven. It's God's will to be done on earth. right? It's not my will to get done. It's his will to get done. Prayer is not me talking God into doing something. Prayer is not me convincing God or tricking God or pressuring or strong-arming God into doing something. And a lot of people struggle with that. And we'll get into those teachings another time about why people struggle with that. But the Word says, Thy will be done. God has a plan. God has always had a plan, and I trust His plan. Not only should we rely on His plan, but look in verse 11, we should rely on His provisions. Look at verse 11. Give us this day... Our daily bread. You ever caught yourself praying for stuff a week ahead of time? <laughs> a month ahead of time? Now, nothing wrong with praying ahead of time. I'm not saying that. But Jesus says when you pray, pray for what you need today. Pray for what you need. Give us this day our daily bread. The Bible says tomorrow will take care of itself when it gets here. You can't deal with tomorrow today. You've got to wait till tomorrow. Then it's today and tomorrow's another day, right? So you can't deal with it. You've got to deal with today when it comes. Jesus says, pray that God will give you what you need for today. When God gave the manna in Israel, he told them to take what you need for that day and leave the rest of it. And it would evaporate or rot or whatever would happen to it. And the next morning they would go out and there would be fresh manna every single day. I bet when that first started, they were probably like, boy, we need to collect all we can get, you know. We're hungry. We need this stuff. And Moses or Aaron or some of the leaders spoke up and said, no, God said don't do it. Just get what you need to eat for today, and God will take care of tomorrow. And the next day they go out, and sure enough, God took care of tomorrow. 
and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Jesus says when we pray, we talk to, to, we talk to him like he's our father. We respect him that he is the God of the, all the universe. We rely on his plan for our life. We rely, secondly, on his provisions for our life. Thirdly, we rely on his protection for our life. Look at verse 13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Jesus said pray for his protection. Pray for his guiding hand. Listen, temptation is all around us. Snares are all around us. Evil is all around us. We need help. And we have to rely on our relationship with God. We rely on Jesus Christ to help us get through these things. The reliance principle. Jesus is teaching them all these things about prayer. Fourthly, I want you to see this in verse number 12. I want you to see the restoration principle when we pray. Jesus said, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. I believe it's Luke's gospel that uses the word uh, trespasses or transgressors right there, talking about sin. You see, this is a principle of restoration twofold. The restoration of person to person to forgive each other, to pray and ask God for us to help us forgive each other, but also to pray and ask God to forgive us, to be in a right standing with God. The restoration, uh, uh, he says, uh, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We should go to God every day, every time we sin, Christian, in prayer and, ask, and tell God we're sorry. And tell God that we ought not to have done that. And ask God to help us not to do it again. And repent. That's what we ought to do. Now that's not something you do once a week. That's something you do multiple times a day. Somebody said, well, I repent every day. I hope you repent more than that. I mean, goodness gracious, I, we sin much more than that. That's one thing, if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit of God will show you when you're wrong and you've messed up, and you go to God and, and, and make things right with Him. And then when we wronged each other, you go and make those things right, and you ask God to help you, right, to help you do that. We're talking uh, to God, all right? The relationship principle, the reverence principle, the reliance principle, the restoration principle, and lastly, when we pray, the rejoicing principle. Look in verse 13 again. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Can't you hear that? Can't you hear the rejoicing in that? Can't you hear Jesus say, For thine is the kingdom. Thine is the power. It's yours, Father. To you be the glory. Great things you have done. That's part of praying. When we pray, we are to rejoice for the wonderful things that God has done. We are to give Him thanks for His blessings. We are to acknowledge His goodness to us. Now, when we pray, do we have to make sure we cover all of these points? Not necessarily. I remember Peter, when Peter was sinking in the Sea of Galilee, he cried out, Lord, save me. That's a prayer. <laughs> now, I didn't cover all those dots we just talked about, but that's a prayer. Simply this, Jesus is giving an all-encompassing teaching on prayer in just a few verses. It's amazing how great a teacher Jesus is. But for you and for I, what are we to do? We're to look at this as an example. We're to look at this as, as principles on how to pray. We're talking to our Father, the relationship principle. We talk to Him with respect. That's the reverence principle. We talk to Him and rely on Him for all of our needs. That's the reliance principle. Uh, we ask Him to forgive us where we've failed. We ask Him to help us forgive each other, the restoration principle. And then we give Him thanks for the wonderful things He's done. That's the rejoicing principle. And your prayer can be any of those. Your prayer could cover all of those. But the main thing is that we pray. Prayer is that beautiful paint that covers the canvas of our faith. We must pray. Pray without ceasing, the Bible says. Pray evermore. Pray. The Bible says in Ephesians, it's one of our weapons of war. To pray, to talk to God. It's what He wants. It's communication between us and God. There are some of you who may be listening to this and you've never prayed at all. Your first prayer might be the most important prayer you ever pray. As a matter of fact, it will be the most important prayer you ever pray. The prayer of a sinner to ask the Lord Jesus Christ to save them, to forgive them, to come into their heart. There used to be a thing, I guess it's still around, called the sinner's prayer where we would repeat, you know, the sinner's prayer. I'm kind of back and forth on that. I, want to, I think when a person prays to get saved, it ought to come from their heart as much as it can be anyway. That's the way I was told anyway. I was told, you've got to do it, you know. And you might be listening to this, and you've 
maybe said a few prayers, God help me with this or different things, but you've never prayed and asked Jesus into your heart. Dear friend, you're not a child of God. Jesus says you try to sneak up another way, you're a thief and a robber. You've got to come through Christ. And if you've never talked to God and prayed and asked him to save you and asked Jesus into your heart, that's the first prayer you need to make. And you can do that prayer tonight. It doesn't have to be certain words. It just needs to come from your heart. That's where prayers come from. Prayers don't come from books. Prayers come from hearts. Search your heart. Open your heart to God and just let come out what's in there. Ask him into your heart to forgive you and to save you. And then you'll be a child of God. Then you'll be able to say, our Father. And for those of you Christians listening who are struggling with prayer, don't overthink it. Don't make it harder than it is. Don't try to make it into a show like some people have. It's not that. Don't try to make it into this big, drawn-out, you know, effigy of words. It's, it's not that. It is simply you communicating with your Savior, and that's all it is. As pure, as simple as it can be. Nobody taught Moses how to pray. He just talked to God. Nobody taught Abraham how to pray. He just talked to God. Nobody taught most of them in the Old Testament how to pray at all. They just talked to God. When the disciples came around, they tried to overthink it, right? They heard Jesus pray. Well, I want to pray like Jesus prays. Jesus said, no, just talk to him. When Jesus was in the garden, he talked to him. He said, Father, if it be thy will, let this cut pass, but not my will, but thine be done. He talked to him. So, Christian, don't overthink it. Your prayer life is the most important thing you have. Once your prayer life falls apart, everything else will too. Your study habit will fall apart. Your Bible reading, your witnessing, your church attendance, it will all fall apart once that prayer life falls apart. So if you've never had a habit of a prayer life, you need to get one. It's not that hard. Just turn to God. Talk to Him. Y'all can get us an invitation hymn tonight, whatever you want to do, whatever's on your heart. We'll take a moment of uh, just quiet and reflection and prayer. Maybe you've never prayed before. I want tonight to be the t- first time you pray. I want it to be the first time you pray. And if you're, you're listening to this and you're not saved, you're not born again, you're not a Christian, okay, The first prayer, your best prayer, will be the prayer that asks Jesus to come into your heart. And you're going to talk to him just like he's sitting right beside of you or standing right beside of you. You're going to talk to him like he's right there. Tell him what you are. You're a sinner. The Bible says we're all sinners. I am too. And that you believe he died for you. And if you do believe that, if you believe it from your heart, pray and ask him in to save you and to forgive you. Dear friend, that's the best prayer there ever has been prayed. And Christians, listen to me. Prayer's not that hard. Just talk to him. Just talk to him. Even when we don't know how to pray. We talked about that earlier. When we're not sure what words to say. The Bible says that the Spirit makes utterances for us. Which, with groanings that cannot be understood. The Spirit of God will pray for us. If we'll just approach God with our hearts open. So in this time they're going to sing us a song. Whatever they've got. Let's just take a moment of reflection. If you're not saved. I want you to give your heart to Christ and be saved tonight. If you've got burdens. I want you to take them to Jesus. And leave them at his feet. Talk to him. Talk to Jesus. He wants to talk to you. Thank you for tuning in with us tonight. As we talked about prayer, we hope it was a help to you. I pray you'll go back and read it. Jesus is the greatest teacher. All I can do is try to explain to you what Jesus has already taught. 
He's the best preacher. He is the teacher. We hope you'll come join us on uh, Sunday. The weather's looking beautiful. I hope it is anyway. Sunday morning, 11 o'clock, we'll have our drive-in service. We'll do it again at 6. Make plans to come out. Uh, it'll be hopefully a beautiful day, and I look forward to seeing you again. Uh, remember, on April the 30th, last day of this month, uh, next Thursday, we'll have a day of uh, fasting and prayer uh, for the churches as we get ready to meet again, but also for our communities and for this virus, so that God will just move through all this, that we'll see revival. Folks, we need one. I believe Jesus is on the verge of coming, and uh, the fields are ready for harvest. So remember that. Keep that on your mind, okay? Let's dismiss in prayer, then I'll see you on Sunday. Father, go with us as we travel the roads, as we travel to work, those who are working. I pray for those who have needs and burdens and cares. I pray that they'll find help in your hands, rest in your arms, and peace, God, in prayer. I pray you'll give us a burden to pray, talk to you more, to share with you more, and to lean on you. I thank you for this night. I pray you'll bless the rest of the week until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. May God bless you. We love you.